is good. Woo, and all the time? I don't think we've done that before. I like that. Let's do it again. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. I am so happy to see all your beautiful faces, especially my family here in the first row. Um, for those that do not know me, my name is Lauren Sienski. I am on staff here with MPI. I love this church. I love serving this church. I love what I do here. Um, I am married to the wonderful and handsome Andrew Sienski. <laughs> we have four beautiful children, and I am so thankful for all that God has done in my life. I'm thankful that he called me. I'm thankful that he saved me, that he took me from a life of destruction, that he gave me a purpose and a plan for my life. And when I see my husband and my children, I'm reminded of God's love for me, and I'm reminded of his plan for me. So I am thankful to Jesus Christ. Are you thankful this morning for what he's done in your life? Amen. Amen. Pastors Joe and Nancy are away on vacation right now. Um, they are, in Pastor Joe's words, suffering for Jesus. They are driving to Florida right now to be at a beach house. So they're going to be suffering hard, suffering hard for Jesus. But all kidding aside, they do deserve it. They are the best pastors in the world. Um, they work very hard for the kingdom of God. And even when they're on vacation, they're still about kingdom business. They're still working hard, and, and they love you, MPI. They work hard for MPI. So I have the privilege and the honor of being able to talk to you today from my personal experience about how to overcome hardships with Jesus. And I can tell you today that there's no other way to overcome a hardship but with Jesus. The world will give us some ideas, and not all of them are bad. I'm not against therapy. I'm not against counseling and things like that when people need it. But the latest idea that I've heard from the world was that a whole bunch of people that have a hard time going on in their life, they have a lot of stress, they go into a forest and they hold hands in the middle of the forest and they scream as loud as they can to get all the stress out of their life. I'm not making it up. That's what they do. And they think when they walk out of the forest that everything is gone. Oh, I feel so relieved now. All my problems are gone. You think that's true? No, they walk out of that forest and they still are dealt, dealing with the same hardships. They still are dealing with the same stress, the same troubles of life that did absolutely nothing for them. And as children of God in this place, as people who call themselves Christians, it is important to know what the Bible says about walking through hardships. It is important to know what the God says in his word about the promises that he's given us as we walk through hardships. So back in November of 2017, I got diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. When I first, uh, it was about two weeks after I had my son Judah, I had some minor issues. I go to the hospital, not thinking really anything was going to happen. They told me that, that they found a mass in my chest. Hold on one second. They said they found a mass in my chest. When I went to the doctor to figure it out, he was very confident that it was there because of pregnancy. So his confidence gave me confidence. I was like, I'm good. It's there because of pregnancy. I'll come back in a few months, and you'll tell me that it's gone. A few months later, I go, I go into that office completely with, with, my, with my guard down, not expecting to hear what I was going to hear next. I'm there with my three-month-old child at the time. I didn't even bring my husband because I'm like, I'm good. doctor was confident. And I walk in there, and he tells me, what kind of symptoms are you having? I said, symptoms? I'm not having any symptoms. And he said, well, actually, it didn't go away. Your mass is still there. And the more that I look at it, it looks like lymphoma to me, cancer. I was shocked. I was shocked. I was not ready to hear that I had cancer. My husband and I started to do the doctor appointments. We had to do a biopsy to see if it was cancer, and in fact, it did come back as Hodgkin's lymphoma. We made an uh, appointment with the oncologist the same day. And I wanted to go into the oncologist's office. I was thinking to myself, I would rather just have surgery. 
Like, just cut it, out, cut it out of me, put me back together. I did not want to hear the words chemo. I did not want to hear the words radiation. I did not want to go down that road. I've watched what chemo had done to people that I loved. I watched chemo destroy people's bodies. And I did not want to go down that way. And as my husband and I were sitting there, of course, her treatment plan. Oh, 30-year-old woman, Hodgkin's lymphoma, that's the most common cancer for someone your age. And your treatment plan is 12 treatments of chemo. I didn't know what to do. I remember looking at my husband and saying, what are we going to do? I have four children. What am I going to do? And my husband looked at me and said, we're going to trust God. We are going to trust God. And that's all I needed to hear from my man of God. And from that moment, it was almost as if we had tunnel vision, my husband and I, 12 treatments along with my family, of course. 12 treatments, just get through these 12 treatments. That's all we have to do. And the countdown began, 11, 10, 9, 8. I began to lose my hair, 7, 6, and so on and so forth. And it wasn't until I got to about the two treatments left that I was able to see an end to it. Oh, it's almost over. This long road, it is almost over. I see the end. And I began to reflect back on all that I just went through, on the times that people didn't see, on the things that people didn't see when I would be alone in my room, in the dark room under my covers crying because it hurt so bad, my body would hurt. And as I would reflect back, those were the times that Jesus met me the most. Those were the times that I got to know Jesus, my intimate best friend. He was so close to me as if almost he can wipe the tears from my eyes, ministering to my heart, telling me, you're not alone. I'm walking with you, Lauren. I got to know Jesus in a way that I never had to know him before. And I am thankful. I am thankful to stand before you today on April 29th and tell you that my last treatment was April 24th, last Tuesday, and I am done with chemo in Jesus' name. I declare it forever. I am done. I am not going back to chemo. I do not like her. Do not like her. <laughs> but I don't want to go on without extending my gratitude to you as a church MPI because I truly felt loved in this place. I am so thankful for every word of encouragement. I'm so thankful for every prayer that I don't even know you prayed for me and my family. I'm so thankful for those that, that wore my bracelet. I'm so thankful that for, for the best surprise party that I've ever had in my entire life. You guys threw that for me. <laughs> I never felt like I wasn't loved. I never felt like you weren't doing enough. I never felt like you didn't have my back. It was almost as if I was running a race and you were alongside of me just clapping like, you got it. You can do it. That's what I felt. That's what I felt from the body of Christ. And I thank you this morning. I thank you. Chemo destroys your immune system. And I know some people might call it stupid to go around people. And I did kind of stay home for six months. And, um, but there was one place I did go. There was one place. And my husband can tell you there was times that I was laid out all week. But when Saturday night came, there was something inside of me that would get excited because church was tomorrow. I was able to come with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I was able to serve the living God. And it changed my perspective. Being in this place helped me understand that I still had a purpose, that I still had a role to play in the body of Christ, that things were bigger than me and my life and my chemo and my family. There was a bigger picture. It wasn't all about me. Church did a mighty thing for my life as I walked through this last season. And I'm thankful that our pastors were gracious with me. Before I got my uh, diagnosis of cancer, I was already very involved with administration 
very behind the scenes and hands-on. And I did have an excuse. I had the best excuse in the world if I wanted to use it to stop doing what I was doing. I could have, I could have stopped. I could have said, I need a six-month break so I can concentrate. But I learned very early on in my diagnosis that I was either going to allow the things that I do for the church, the serving that I do to become a burden to me, or I was going to allow it to heal my heart. And I was going to allow it to bring joy in a time, in a season that was hard. And that's exactly what it did. Every single task done, I felt such a joy in my heart because I was a part of the bigger picture. I was doing something for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. I want to encourage you this morning to get to know Jesus now. I want to encourage you this morning to know what the Bible says about trials and tribulations, to know what it says when he promises to walk hardships with you. There's people in this room who do discipleship, who do 201, who go to life groups, who do the things. And it's not just so you could check something off on a, on a thing. Oh, I'm in discipleship. That's what they want from me. That's not what it's want. That's not what it's for. This is your training ground right now. This is your training ground so that you know what the promises of God are for your life because none of you are exempt from the troubles of life. None of us in this room are exempt. They will come. It's not about if, it's when. And when they do come, will you be able to stand? Will you know what the Bible says? Will you know what he has promised you? This is your training ground. Get to know Jesus now. Get to know what he says. Nobody is exempt from the trials of life. And it reminds me of a story in the Bible. If you could put it on the screen, Matthew 8, 23 through 26. It says, then he got into a boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, can you say suddenly? A furious storm came upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. I love Jesus. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the waves and the winds, and they were completely calm. The storms of life. They come without warning. They come suddenly. The disciples didn't see the clouds turning black. They didn't hear the rumble of the thunder. They didn't see the lightning strike or they would have said, hey, we don't think we should get into that boat. They didn't see the warning signs coming. It came suddenly in an instant. And that's how the storms of life come into our life. In an instant, our life changes. You have cancer. In an instant, your life changes. You get a phone call. Someone you love has died. Suddenly. But we have a choice to make. We always have a choice to make. And it's a choice of who we're going to be in the story. We can be like the disciples full of fear. Or we can be like Jesus, well-rested through the storm, understanding that God is with us and that his promises are yes and amen for our lives, and he has promised to walk with us. No, the Bible has not said we will not have troubles. It's actually the opposite. If you could put up the scripture, John 16, 33. It says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. <laughs> That's not really like fun to hear, right? Like in this world, you will have trouble. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks. In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will face things that you never thought that you would have to face. In this world, you will get sick. You might even get cancer. But it's very important to pay attention when Jesus says things like this because he didn't stop there. He didn't just say, you're going to have trouble. They had a, a big butt there. <laughs> 
And when he says, but, you better take, take, uh, pay attention and open your ears. He said, take heart. You might have trouble, but take heart. Be courageous. Be brave. Stand on the rock of your salvation. Stand on the promises of God. Why, Jesus? Why do I have to stand? Why should I take heart? Because I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. That means that my God is bigger than cancer. That means that my God is bigger than death. That means that my God is bigger than any bill that you have to pay, every financial problem. My God is bigger, and if he overcame, so have you through him. You are an overcomer in Jesus. I am an overcomer in Jesus. Woo! I got to get it out. <laughs> He didn't say we wouldn't have trouble. He says that we would lie down in green pastures. He said he would lead us beside quiet waters. He said that he would restore our soul. He didn't say that you won't face death. He said that he would lead you along the right path for his namesake. That even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that God would be with you and you have nothing to fear because his rod and his staff, they comfort you. It's Psalm 23. You should memorize it. That's what the Bible says. In Psalm 91, he says he'll be a refuge, a safe place, a place of shelter for you. My sister shared it earlier. His name is a strong tower. Those who run to it are safe. He has promised these things for us. See, chemo was able to destroy things in my body. It took my hair. The most bogus thing it did was take my eyebrows. <laughs> I could have I kept my eyebrows chemo. <laughs> I really learned that uh, I gained a lot of respect for you ladies that draw on your eyebrows every day. That is like next level beauty care. I'm so proud of you guys. <laughs> Just that is that is that was rough. That was rough. That was rough. But chemo was able to destroy things in my body. It killed the bad cells, the good cells. Took my hair right, took my eyebrows. But one thing it couldn't do was destroy my soul. It couldn't touch my soul. Because the Bible says that only one can destroy the soul. So that means that only one can save the soul. And if I'm on his side and he's on my side, that means I'm surrounded by safety on every side. And so are you if you believe it this morning. You are surrounded by safety. The troubles of life can never take away the promises of God. Never. And it would have been so easy for me in my flesh to fall into, I'm sorry, my do-rag is falling off. I gotta fix it. It would have been so easy for me in my flesh to fall into a place of despair. To look at myself and say, hey, I'm a 30-year-old woman. I had this long hair. It's all gone. I'm beginning to look different. I feel like myself on the inside, but then I look in the mirror and I'm like, who is that? My flesh would have liked to go to a place of depression. But the Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, it says, do not be anxious about anything. Can you say anything? Anything. anything. Do not be anxious about anything. You mean I don't have the permission from God to be anxious when I get cancer? I don't have the permission from the writer of Philippians to be anxious when someone dies. Do not be anxious about anything. Well, then tell me, how do I guard my heart from it? But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, say thanksgiving. 
Present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Why did Paul put thanksgiving in there? Why didn't he just say, by prayer and petition, present your request to God? Why did he have to add a little bit of thanksgiving? Because he knew that it was a heart of thanksgiving that opens the road for the peace of God to come and guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It was the heart of thanksgiving that was a cure to my despair. It was the heart of thanksgiving that was a cure to depression. The heart of a thanksgiving will be the cure for what you're facing. You'll stop, to look, you'll stop looking at what you don't have and start to see what you do have. Amen? And I remember, to give you a little more background on my life, I come from a family where my mother died from cancer when I was five years old. She had to go through chemo. My dad raised four children on his own. And you'll notice that he's starting to go gray. I'm pretty sure that 90% of that is from raising me. <laughs> I am very thankful that my dad never gave up on me because I know I wouldn't be standing here today when I was wiling out. <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. But I come from a family where my mother has died from cancer. It was a tragedy in our life. It's something that affected not just my immediate family, but my aunts and my, 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 uh, my whole family, cousins, whoever. And then to give you a little bit of back, more background, when I actually got first went to the doctor, they didn't only find a mass in my chest, they also found an aneurysm in my artery. And what an aneurysm is, is a ball of blood. And the more pressure and the more blood that goes to it, the higher risk that you have of rupturing it. So when I was pregnant with my son Judah, they kept telling me after we found out that it was there, your greatest risk of rupture was when you were pregnant. We usually find these things in an autopsy. So I was at the point in this, this part of my life where I, I was thankful. Hey, we found this thing. We took care of it within the three months that I was waiting for my diagnosis of cancer. We were taking care of that situation. It was almost as if I like maneuvered death, like, hey, I'm alive. <laughs> I was excited. I was already past the point of shock of getting cancer. I was already past the point of getting chemo. I'm sitting in my room one day, and I get a phone call from a family member. And she was hysterical. I mean, I'm like chilling in my room, quiet, cool. And I answer the phone, and she is hysterical. I can't believe this is happening to you. Oh my gosh, your mom died from cancer. She had four kids. You have four kids. What if you die from cancer? I mean, she was just speaking all those things over me. <laughs> and I thought to myself, man, like I, I hope she's going to be OK. <laughs> I, I hope she's going to make it through. <laughs> But something in her conversation, it flipped. It went from freaking out to telling me, oh, you must be so angry at God. And as I think about it, I could, I could imagine her, her train of thought. Lauren, you went to Bible college. You chose Jesus over the world. You chose Jesus over going to get a career or, or whatever. You work for this church that, that's kind of small, or, and, and look what God gave you. Look at what you got. You must be so angry at God. And I remember I stopped her very calmly, and I said, listen, I am not angry. I am thankful. I am thankful. I'm thankful for my family. I am thankful for my children. I am thankful for my husband. I am thankful that I got to wake up this morning. I was thankful for my church. I was thankful for my pastors. I was thankful that they actually had a treatment plan for the cancer that I got diagnosed with. I was thankful, and it guarded my heart from anger. It guarded my heart from 
anything that would try to come in that was not of God. It guarded my heart and my mind in the peace of God. And the evidence that you have a heart of thanksgiving is that you will be consumed with peace. Consumed. A heart of thanksgiving changes your perspective. It changes your perspective. You'll start to see eternal value in your temporary situations. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, therefore, we do not lose heart. We heard that earlier. We heard that earlier from Jesus. We do not lose heart. We do not stop being courageous. We do not stop standing on the promises and the righteousness of God. Though outwardly we are wasting away, though our body of flesh may have cancer, though we may actually be dying, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. We are strong. We are strong in who God made us. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Pastor Joe preached an awesome message on this not that long ago. If you want it, we will send it to you. But he was talking about, in perspective of eternity, our 80 years on this life, that the troubles that we face, though as hard as they may be, they are still light, and they are only momentarily compared to the eternal glory that we will face, that the eternal glory that's being prepared for us. There is a purpose in the pain. There is an eternal purpose in the pain. Band, would you come, please? You choose today what you're going to focus on. You choose today what you're going to look at. If you're going to look at the temporary, if you're going to look at your temporary situation, if you're going to look at the cancer, if you're going to look at the death, you choose today or if you're going to look at Jesus. I choose to put my hope in Jesus. I choose to put my, fix my eyes on Jesus. You know, there's things in our life that it's always changing. Like I said earlier, they come without warning. The storms of life, the things that happen, and we can all relate to it. In an instant, your life can change. In an instant, yesterday, you, you wake up fine. The next day, you have news that you have cancer. I mean, things are always changing, but we can have the confidence that the Bible says that there is one that doesn't change. It says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? God doesn't change. Your situation, your circumstance may change, but he is the same and he will remain the same. So that means that the same God that was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the day is the same God that walks with you today, is the same God that was good a long time ago in the Old Testament, is the same God that is with you today, the same God that gave Daniel courage to go into a lion's den is the same God that gives you courage to walk through every trial, every tribulation that you could ever face. 
the same God that was with Esther as she stood before a king and he, she found favor and saved the people is the same God that is in this room right now. The same God. And He is good. He is faithful. He is good. Always good. Always faithful. I can't say it enough. Oh, all throughout my time of treatment, that's all that I heard in my spirit. Good God. Good, faithful God. You're a good God. You're a faithful God. You will not leave me. You promised me good things. It's all I heard in my spirit. Good and faithful God. And the same God that walked with me through every hardship, through every pain, through every ache, is the same God that will walk with you if you believe in his promises today, if you get to know the Jesus of the Bible, if you get to know his words. Altar workers, would you come?